now there's just silence. Mm -mm -mm. And they think they want more nukes. That's what I'm trying to do. Testing again, can you all hear us on the WebEx? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that, the uh, fun of coming to a new, new space. So before we get with our uh, speaker, I thought we'd let um, everyone on the authority here in the room uh, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, so that way uh, Simon knows who's here. So definitely. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Fox, University of Virginia. Virgin Americans. So. Woody Wallen, also. It's not, the volume's not very good. Okay, can everybody speak up? So we... John Capps, Virginia Community College. Bill Bristow to George Washington University. Tom DePonte with Graham Tom. Scott Koppel, BWX2, Tim Stellar, Virginia Economic Development Partner. Will Benner, Virginia Department of Energy. Brian Wells, Virginia Department of Energy. Okay, so um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Simon Glenn, who's here on behalf of uh, Potential Energy. Um, to talk a little bit about some of the research um, they've been they've been conducting, which is really interesting on on some of the message you've been pulling around uh, nuclear energy. So Simon has spent 25 years as a management consulting partner, uh, leading a great many global research efforts. He's a senior partner at Lipicot, a brand and innovation specialist. He co-leads the climate and sustainability platform for Oliver Wyman, a global consulting firm. Board member of Replanet, a science led environmental movement, and founder of Zero Ideas, a research and education nonprofit challenging business thinking on climate. Simon helped incubate uh, potential energy back in 2007, and he has worked with the team ever since, helping bring 
the most advanced research and marketing techniques from the private sector to build support for clean energy. He has a degree in physics from the University of Cambridge and welcome him here today uh, for a little bit more information on the most recent research. Simon, all yours. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, set up. So, yes, there's lots of different things in there, but here representing potential energy, uh, which is a um, was set up by a former colleague of mine, John Marshall, um, who was with me at Lippincott. And uh, it's its focus is really to take the sort of some of the disciplines that we have in brand and marketing in the in the private sector and apply them to um, to the to the public sector and in particular to influencing how people think about climate change and clean energy um more more broadly uh, and what i'm sharing today and thank you for for having us to do that is a, a research study that we did uh, we say globally it wasn't really globally but it was eight countries which is is um better than better than one um i know it's a minority of the world um on attitudes to nuclear and in particular attitudes to new nuclear um, uh, advanced nuclear in whatever language you want to use uh, to try and understand what the what the sort of barriers were to that, what the perceptions were to that, what the guidance is on on how to uh, how to talk about that. Um, to the question in the and the thing, what I will do is just share a uh, share a screen. Uh, one second. Um, Is that is that sharing well? Yes, it looks like it is. Um, so there's a there's a there's a QR code in the top right. I don't know if you're close enough, or at least for people on WebEx to um, uh, to take it from the QR code. There's a URL that's on the final page that I'll show as well in terms of a link to the uh, uh, to the full report. Uh, it's a report um, we call the world wants new nuclear because that is essentially the uh, the finding. It was a very positive finding in terms of where perceptions are. There's, as we all know, a lot of noise about nuclear, but what this re research is really finding uh, is that that noise comes from a relatively concentrated, relatively specific and small section of the population. And actually, from a kind of silent majority point of view, the support for nuclear is really surprisingly strong. So I'll, I'll take you through the findings about that. Um, so what it's based on, uh, we did quite a thorough a uh, quant exercise of altogether a um, bit over 13,000 people globally uh, with a particular focus on the US. So we had altogether 7,000 people in the US. Uh, and although we didn't really design it this way, that scale meant that we had more than 200 people in Virginia. And so we've been able to uh, uh, give you some Virginia specific results. Obviously, we can't do a lot of sort of slicing and dicing within that 200 because it's too small, but it, but 200 is enough to be a useful guide to see how Virginia kind of calibrates with some of the other uh, data that we're saying. Uh, so we did this in eight countries across three continents, as well as the US. We had five European countries and Japan and South Korea. Um, and it's a quantitative study of, of um, re nationally representative population uh, and including, you'll see towards the end uh, uh, in some of what we show, we did it so that we could actually do a, a randomized control trial. In other words, why, why the sample size was so big was we could show different narratives to different people and see how that affected their, their views and make some of that comparison to understand not just asking people um, a response to a narrative, but, but deducing it in terms of how their views about nuclear that they tell us are different depending on who saw what narrative at the start of the survey. Um, it's done by a bunch of independent NGOs. It's not industry funded or any of those things that people ask about. Um, uh, potential energy, clear path, third way, all US based and replanet from over here, which is in case you can't tell, I'm I'm based in London. Um, so that's that's what we are uh, basing all of this stuff on. Jumping into what we learned. Um, so you're going to see a lot of results. First of all, I'll present lots of data. I hope it's, in, you know, intelligible and digestible. Um, but there are, there is a, a report to go through afterwards, if not, but I'll try and sort of focus on bringing out the key stories. Um, uh, the sort of key test question we used with it was this statement, uh, whether or not people agree that I support the use of the latest nuclear energy technologies to generate ele electricity alongside other energy sources. So we're asking about nuclear energy. We're phrasing it in a slightly technology way. 
uh, we're asking it in the context of electricity and we're acknowledging that this is a, a multiple thing. This isn't nuclear as opposed to alternatives. It's within the mix of other energy sources. Uh, when we ask it that way, you can see there the, the range from uh, I strongly agree to that statement in the dark blue on the left to I strongly disagree in black on the on the right. I think the striking points are in every question, the uh, sorry, in every country, the agree outweighs the disagree. The two blues outweigh, outweigh the gray and black by some by some multiple. Um, even in Germany and Japan, which are the least supportive of the eight countries that we tested, it's still a substantial majority um, that are uh, that are supportive. Um, and Virginia slightly above the US average overall, not very different um, in terms of the sample size, not very different in support, but actually, and you'll see on another slide in a minute, significantly um, low um, low rejection, low, low strong disagreement with that statement in, uh, in Virginia. But so typically across the world on average, something like a five to one ratio of, of um, agree to disagree on that statement. Um, we also asked a modification slightly differently to make it about a local context. I'd be happy for my local for my local electricity company to use advanced nuclear. Uh, and in that context, again, the overall numbers were very similar. And again, when you look at Virginia, it particularly stands out the really, really small, strong disagree sliver. Again, I don't know how well you can see the data in the in the big room that you're in, but that's a 25% strongly agree and only 4% strongly disagree. Um, in Virginia, which is um, agree is very similar picture to US overall, but the dis strongly disagree is is four percent rather than eight percent for the US overall. So very very small disagreeing tail in Virginia. Again, bearing in mind that's a two hundred sample size, so that's like eight people in that black box. So there may be some um, some fluctuation, but directionally, I think it's it's robust. Um, we also asked the question different way, um, less nuanced. So this question, the, the question you saw before came at the beginning of the questionnaire. This question came at the end of the questionnaire where we had been through all sorts of nuclear issues in about a 20 minute uh, a, a questionnaire. We'd raised issues about nuclear waste. We'd, we'd raised issues about nuclear meltdowns. We put everything out on the table for them. Uh, so we weren't hiding anything. And at the end of a 20 minute uh, survey when they sort of exposed to all of that, both the benefits and some of those issues. We then asked the question in a different way that had no fuzzy places to go in the middle. It was a yes, no, should advanced nuclear be an important part of the solution to our energy challenges? And when we force people off the fence in that yes or no, and we've already taken them through all of those uh, issues, then at least two thirds of people in every country, including Japan, including Germany, um, and 82% in Virginia said yes when when forced in that sort of come off the fence way. Another interesting thing we asked in this survey whether people um, the question in small print you almost certainly can't see in the room at the bottom that says are you a member or supporter of any environmental organisations such as Greenpeace, WWF, Nature Conservancy. And when we cut the data by how people asked that question, we found that again, in all countries, um, members, if we just look at people who say they are a member or supporter of an environmental organization, there is still net support for nuclear among all of those environmental supporters. That's not a question about what their organization support, but if you look at their members and supporters, they are net supporters of nuclear energy in the way we're asking this question. And then if you take that to the US specifically, this wasn't true in all countries, wasn't true in some of the European countries, but it is true in the US that not only do supporters outweigh uh, rejectors or opponents, I should say, um, in the environmental uh, members, but actually members of environmental organizations in the US are more supportive of nuclear uh, than people who are not members or supporters of those organizations. So those two blue bars um, adding to 65% for members and uh, whatever that is, 62% um, uh, for non-members, 61% for non-members um, are significantly more supportive. Now, you also notice on the right of that chart, you could you could give you a headline the other way, 
um, if I were so minded, that says that environmentalists also reject nuclear more than uh, non-environmentalists. That ni that black nine percent is bigger than the seven. Uh, 10 is bigger than 9. It's true, but they do it by less. So overall, the, the, the bigger effect is still that. Uh, uh, and that basically just says people who are member of environmentalists know what they think more than people who aren't. So that yellow don't really know how to think in the middle is much smaller for environmentalists. So that's part of the effect, but it's not a symmetrical effect. The the um, uh, the growth is bigger in the, in the um, support than in the rejection and the opposition. I can go back on any of these that I know there's there's a lot to digest in some of these. Uh, we also looked at gender. I think it's quite well known that um, support for nuclear skews male, and that's indeed what we found. You can see on the left in particular, um, much higher levels of support of, of agreeing with this same old statement um, among male than female. But what's interesting about that is that the big difference is not in the disagree. The big difference is in the yellow bit in the middle again. So the th that gender difference in support really reflects much greater react, uh, neutrality among women rather than rejection among women. The actual rejection is not much bigger. It's a little bit bigger, but it's not much bigger. The big difference among women is the neutrality rather than the rejection. Um, also interesting to see in Virginia, again, being a bit cautious of the sample size, that the, the gender skew is not as big as it seems to be in the US overall. I got 10 of these, I think, just to give you an idea. So I'm, I'm halfway through sharing these and then we can dig into, I've seen questions appearing in the thing faster than I can read them. So um, we can go back into those in a minute. Um, also looking at age demographics. Uh, so we looked at this in a different way. This is actually, this is about strong rejection. So the sort of the serious opposition, the size of that black bar in the, in the uh, charts that we've just been looking at. How does the size of that black bar in each country differ by age group? And I think what's interesting about this is that even in the countries with significant levels of nuclear rejection, which is to say Germany and Japan, the blue and yellow lines at the top, um, the only real step up, I'm oh, sorry, the, the only real high level in, in um, rejection comes among the older age groups. So even in Germany and Japan, when you look in the 18 to 34s, you know, there is no country where that black bar is more than 8% of the um, of the population. And Virginia um, uh, sitting in the middle. Again, with no, um, no big age difference across, uh, across Virginia or, or indeed um, in the US, they're both pretty flat. You get the same effect, by the way, as I was talking about with gender, that, that as you get older, you know what you think more on this topic. And so you can sort of, um, if you're not careful, you can you can make this, um, you know, t tell the story both ways around. But the, the net effect of this is when you look at that strong rejection, it's really not a very big effect in most countries. Um, a lot to digest if you wanted to read the words on this, but the general pattern is not very difficult to read which is that nuclear support really transcends politics in most countries. So what you've got here is supporters of uh, different political parties in each country and what percentage of each party's supporters um, uh, agree with that statement that you've seen in most of the other slides about supporting advanced nuclear. And uh, the dark blue bars are where there's a majority support among among sorry majority support for nuclear among supporters of each of, of the party, and the light blue is where it doesn't hit that fifty percent mark. So in most cases, they are the sort of relatively small, relatively left or green party um, in Sweden and in Germany. Um, uh, the 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 sort of two sub substantial parties in there. Uh, are the Social Democrats in Germany and the CDP in Japan, which are kind of mainstream parties that don't hit the 50% mark uh, in those two countries. But actually, in most of the other countries, including, um, you know, most of the European countries, you can see even the supporters of the Green parties are uh, net positive for nuclear. And in the US, you can see how um, evenly it, it support is across Republican, Democrat and Independent. And just drilling into the US, again, here's that picture that was on the top left of the previous chart, um, but reproduced with Virginia next to it. 
uh, compared to the US NAT rep, it's, it's pretty similar in Virginia. Having said that, that support is um, really non nonpartisan and even across um, parties, which is which is true and true across countries and pretty interesting. Actually, the motivation for what that support is is not quite as as even and uniform uh, as those previous charts might expect. So, if you in this one, we've asked people. This is U.S. data, U.S. national rep. So, not just Virginia, but all of U.S. Um, we've asked people at the bottom along the x-axis to identify where they are on a spectrum from very liberal to very conservative. And we've also we've shown them a bunch of narratives about why and why they might support advanced nuclear. And we've given them an option to say, choose which of these is the reason why you might support it. Uh, and they have the option of choosing the black one at the top, which is I wouldn't support it. I wouldn't choose any of those, but you might support advanced nuclear for reasons of energy independence. I'm reading from the bottom or about American innovation or about stopping climate change or about um, to preserve our country's precious land, pre precious land rather than letting it all go under under solar and wind um, to sustain our quality of life um, and be a sort of uh narrative around opportunity and, and a sort of forward-looking technology story to, to allow us to continue to prosper and do everything we want uh it might be about keeping jobs and money in our communities we gave them all of those options and you can see the proportion that um chose each of those options for, for each of the different political groups and i think what i find interesting on this is the is the asymmetry in particular of the yellow one, which is not that surprising in the US, um, that the climate change, you know, is a much stronger argument on the left than it is on the on the on the, on the right. No great surprise there. Uh, but what's interesting is that the uh, American innovation and making our own energy independently, there's a little bit of skew to sort of balance that out overall, but they are actually um, arguments that work across both. So there are there are some arguments that work more politically aligned and some that are uh, that are more evenly across. It's the it's the asymmetry of this that the fact that climate change skews one way, but the other arguments don't skew nearly as much the other way. Um, so very small yellow on the on the right of the chart, but quite substantial blue on the left. And therefore, when we put that together, um, you know, we look at um, this is this is a result of the, the what we did as of one of these randomized control trials. So we gave people a short narrative where they only saw one of them right at the beginning before they saw anything else. They saw one narrative. It might have been a narrative about energy independence or one about clean innovation or one about climate goals and so on. Um, each person only saw one and some people saw none. Uh, and then we looked at what's the difference in support, depending on what narrative you you saw. So if you saw none to begin with, your narrative support started at uh, where it says control group at the bottom at 52.7%. Um, but there were substantial lifts um, in levels of support for some of these narratives. Um, there was some support for all of them, but in particular, the clean innovation and energy independence narratives are the ones that gave um, a, a substantial uplift in how people um, think about nuclear. So that was sort of 10 highlights from this. We've got uh, lots more. We did a whole sort of segmentation for looking at how different parts of the market um, see it. If you like to think of it as a market using, using that sort of brand and marketing discipline that we bring to it. Um, we looked at reaction to different types of names and whether the nuclear name is, is, is you know, tainted or not tainted, to which the answer is no, it's not tainted. Um, there was there was no no need to worry about the nuclear name. Uh, so lots more in the uh, in the report, but that's a um, uh, that's a summary. Um, if you can, I, I don't have a sort of handy just be able to read out a URL that that's easy to do. So maybe it needs to be shared electronically afterwards. If you're if you're somewhere where you can see the screen, there's a QR code for the uh, report. Um, the URL underneath it is probably, if you can't see the QR code, you probably can't see the URL either, but um, maybe somebody, maybe I can I can put it in the chat in a bit or something like that. But um, uh, anyway, we we have it. There is a full written report available. Simon, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I mean, having seen various parts of this presentation, but not the Virginia specific piece, um, that was very, very interesting and really helpful. And, we will um, for folks uh, on the on the WebEx, and then also um, on the authority. We'll make sure we can 
get the link to the report around around to the to the whole group. Um, we have a little bit of time, so I would um, like to open it up. Um, and before we open it up with questions, I do want to just remind for especially for everyone um, on the WebEx that there is a, a formal uh, time period at the end of the meeting that is set up and that we will allow for public comment. But the content during the meeting, this is really um, reserved for dialogue between um, our speakers and and the authority members. Um, so I know there's some, some questions in the chat or some some comments of you know kind of there ones from the from the authority we can discuss those and have the dialogue with Simon. Otherwise we'll make sure we um, address any questions or comments from the public uh, during that formal period of the agenda. So I think um, I saw Glenn had a question um, was there any Brent? Are there any other from the from the chat? Uh, but Glenn, if you want to ask, if you want to ask your question of, of Simon and any other authority members, if you want to, if you have questions on the WebEx or in the room, we can answer. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Um, just uh, two quick questions. One was, uh, if N was only two twenty, what's the margin of error for Virginia's numbers on that study? Uh, so we'd have to look at look at that for. I mean, 220 is small. 220, as I said at the introduction, is not what we were um, designing the study for when we went in to do it. It was a sort of, oh, that's convenient. Because we did 13,000, we basically designed it so that we'd have 700 people per cell for the randomized control trial. That was the sort of what was driving our numbers. And then it was a fortuitous thing that says, oh, we should be able to give you some directionally interesting answers because we've got, you know, a useful sample in Virginia. So I, um, without... You, you kind of need to look at it, that question by question because it's messy in terms of how big the differences were. I think what we're really showing with the, and in particular, I think 220 when we're giving you an answer of how something is for the whole of Virginia is 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 not bad for the, um, uh, is, is meaningful, is useful for the sort of results that we're, we're presenting. When you start splitting that up into groups, when you do the age one that says, oh, let's look at those three different age groups and how do they compare so that each one is at best a third of 220, and you're doing differences between them, then you're then you're kind of scraping at the limits of what you should probably do. Yeah. And the last question, um, I know you had a question on there that said that should look your locality or uh, utilize nuclear technology. And I'm wondering if did you ask a question more specific of are do, would it be okay or or how do you feel or do you would you support a nuclear reactor in your county or city? Because I'm wondering, you know, a city using nuclear technology uh, just means I'm bringing in electrons from a nuclear plant that could be, you know, cities away. It, do you think we can correlate that to whether they support a nuclear reactor in their city? Or is that, do you think that needs to be a separate question? Uh, it's what we were trying to imply. Um, we were trying not to use the reactor word because some of what we were trying to do was explore, you know, are, are we kind of making life more difficult for ourselves when we use when we use scary words? Indeed, is nuclear a scary word? And we discovered it wasn't because we we tested alternatives and nuclear tested well. Um, but it, that, that's the reason why we use slightly peculiar technology rather than saying reactor because reactors is one of those words. Do you want you know radioactivity down your street? Is a sort of loaded question. Um, and so that's why we were trying to say, would you be okay if your local electricity company? You know, you use so we we weren't trying we were trying to imply the localness of of bringing it there. We were trying to describe a reactor in the neighborhood, but without using the reactor word, and and, and that's why we also tested different naming. When we did test different naming, by the way, nuclear tested absolutely fine. Small modular reactor tested worst of all the names that we tested. So, um, and that's probably not really about being small and modular. It's probably the other bit. Thank you. Thomas. Simon, thank you. Scott Coppola, you know, you actually had two questions. Top of your briefing as you began, I think you touched on the subject of advanced versus, I'll say, existing. So I'm curious when you dug into that or if you asked a specific question on how people feel again, new versus existing in some, just that in some way, and then how that might correlate policy making because we've seen in the past where they've been treated differently, well, particularly at the federal level, maybe until recently, but it's the form of tax credits and those kinds of things. Um, sunset provisions, what counts, what doesn't count. 
to those sort of economic incentives and kind of more state for that matter might be able to offer. So I'm curious if you asked a question or a question similar to the line of questioning I'm, I'm throwing at you. Uh, so I thought you said something in the top. So, um, we did it the way that we did it because the, the sort of thought was, is, is the advent of a new generation of nuclear technologies an opportunity to kind of position the industry differently, to treat it as a sort of big product launch moment? Is this like sort of the difference between, between traditional cell phones and an iPhone and a, and a, and a sort of opportunity to reposition it? Um, and that was, that was some of the thinking around it. So that's why we used language like the latest nuclear technologies. We didn't get into, you know, here's the difference between an old nuclear and new, a new nuclear. We didn't sort of define what an SMR was. We didn't distinguish between SMR and AMR and all those things that we now get questioned about. And, and that was sort of deliberate because that's not really something that the public, I think, gets its head around. Um, but we but we were sort of trying to say if you thought of nuclear in the context of something that was current and new technology and innovative and 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 you know looking forward as opposed to any image that you might or might not have of nuclear which i now offend you all about of of sort of you know um gray 1960s dials and control rooms then then you know does that help change how we think about it? So we weren't really trying to test a sort of defined generation. We were just trying to sort of position nuclear in that context of something that has new generations, um, new solutions, and and new new technologies that are being innovated now, rather than rather than however else people might think about it. But we were also trying. There's, there's a balance because there's that opportunity. But we were exactly not trying to. Um, sort of draw a line between that generation and sort of one's good and one's not good or anything like that. I know it's a slightly fuzzy answer to your question, but I think that's because the answer is slightly fuzzy. It's fair. Your, your study is what it is. And I appreciate your, uh, your answer. I think you know, where, you're, where you were coming from. Um, second question really was on timing. If you said this at the top, forgive me, because I noticed in a couple of the slides were in the international comparing countries, Poland, it's like I think 1092 and the next country was 82 and just I'll come I'm curious the timing and maybe if you've seen it done previous studies how sort of world events might shape people's views considering Poland and Russian gas and Ukraine and everything going on really since the period of February. Um again, so like a 10 point difference. There were a few other slides too where it was sprinkled in where Poland had a slightly Say more positive outlook than the next year's country. Um, so, so the, the easy answer is when the timing was, which was the the back end of last year's cre and and spilling over into the beginning of this year. So definitely, you know, within the uh, within the Ukraine war, well within the Ukraine war period, and not not right at the beginning of it. I mean, it's it's, it's interesting because you see both effects coming out of the news flow. One is obviously particularly in Poland, the sort of um, the vulnerability and need a need for um, uh, clean energy, but actually in Poland, Poland's mostly a transition from coal, not a position, not a transition from gas. Um, and so, you, you know, you might expect that to be influencing it more in in Germany. That's most exposed to the sort of Russian gas problem. Um, a lot of the transition going on in Poland is a is a coal to nuclear transition, and they have their own coal. So actually, in terms of energy security, they're they're happy with coal. Um, there's all the other issues with coal, but it's not really an energy security issue so much in Poland. Um, so I don't know that that would be driving it quite so much. And then of course you also get headlines in the newspapers all about whether. The Russians are about to blow up Ukrainian nuclear power stations. So they've been in it's sort of added to the to the negative publicity about nuclear as well because of of sort of military risks to the to the power stations that happens in the press in, in Europe. I don't know how much it is there. So um I, I, I again I can only speculate because I don't have a like for like comparison. We didn't we didn't do a similar survey before the Ukraine war. Um but those are some of the reasons for thinking that it's not um I mean, I'm I'm sure it affects it. It may go on affecting it, though. So it may be just sort of this is this is the um, this is the new way. So I, I don't really have a benchmark from beforehand to compare it with. But that that is the timing, and I think the 
uh, it, it, it's it's not obvious that that would drive a sort of big skew in Poland. Thank you. Uh, did you actually specify since the view the other options, wind, solar, water, fossil fuel? Um, no, so we we talked about whether or not you supported the use of nuclear um, alongside. I can't remember how we put it, but alongside other energy sources in the in the in, in the statement. But we didn't um, we we didn't want to get into a sort of do you prefer nuclear to the or, or sort of there was quite a lot of guidance from um, interviews we did with the industry. So it wasn't to a question in the in the chat. It wasn't sponsored by the industry. Uh, but we did talk to people from the industry and from academics and from other places first, just to try and make sure that we could get our, our narratives and language um, as as relevant as possible and as salient as possible and and um, build on whatever uh, had already been been learned. Uh, and in that, there was quite a lot of you know wariness about being seen to position nuclear against renewables because it's not positioned against renewables; it's complementing renewables. And so that was how we how we um, asked the question. Uh, that's why we had alongside other energy sources in the question. Another question. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear very well on the WebEx. Sorry. Um, what were the numbers for Japan and has been over 2 The numbers for? Japan. Oh, for, for Japan. Uh, so Japan, I could just show it you again. One second. Um, so Japan in this measure, um, which also has that that question that we were just talking about at the top, um, support the use of the latest nuclear energy technologies to generate electricity alongside other energy sources. Um, Japan, so it's um, just over, uh, sorry, it's just under fifty percent support on this measure. Um, it's the only one that's un that doesn't hit the fifty percent support, but that's because it's also the one with the biggest neutral yellow bar. So even though the support level on this, the bl the two blue bars put together, don't quite hit fifty percent, the support is substantially bigger than the opposition. That's that one point six to one ratio on the right. That's on that question, and then uh, the other one that I think is interesting for Japan is this one where we did the come off the fence question. You've seen everything about nuclear. You've seen the pluses. You've seen the minuses. And then we ask you the black and white question without without anywhere to go in that yellow bit uh, that says, do you believe that advanced nuclear should be an important part of the solution to our energy challenges? And they're 65% of Japan, less than anywhere else, but still 65%, two thirds of people uh, say yes when they have to say yes or no. Hey, Simon, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, first of all, I just want to say thank you <laughs> because I think um, folks that compile these kinds of data sets often get hammered with lots of follow up questions. But um, I just, I just appreciate you all doing this um, and on the global scale. And second, I guess the question is if you were in our shoes, um, how, how do you see us? best utilizing this information in what ways? And then if there was a follow-up study where we dug in more specifically to um, Virginia and, and gathered a larger sample size, based on what you learned, um, what might you want to dig into more? That's a good question. I'm not sure I fully know what your shoes are, but um, so I, I, I think that um, one of the thoughts that we had behind doing this uh, study was, you know, is nuclear badly misunderstood? Um, uh, should we, you know, are we are we sort of missing an opportunity, depending on who we are, to to talk about it differently? As I've said before, is nuclear bad name, et cetera, et cetera. I think overwhelmingly, what we found in this study is. 
um, that actually it's not about repositioning it or calling it something else or what have you. Um, I, I think there were some findings that we found around particularly the sort of new nuclear SMR story where, as I said, small me a modular reactor was the sort of least good word um, where we also tested various iconography and the um, the image of cooling towers is the least good image of any of the iconography that we used. So when everybody talks about SMRs and keeps showing pictures of cooling towers, you're not doing yourselves any favor. Nobody knows what that stuff coming out of the top of a cooling tower is and it looks worse than it is. Um, and in general, I would say that a lot of the, the sort of style of communication is quite, um, quite technology oriented and, um, uh, uh, not surprisingly, a lot of the a lot of the um, SMR companies are tech companies and see themselves as tech companies, and that's sort of what they are for attracting talent and all the rest of it. But actually, in terms of some of the imagery and language and things that we tested and narratives that we tested, um, anything that makes it a bit more down to earth, a bit more human, a bit more just straightforward and neighbourly, rather than this sort of exotic tech uh, image, is is much more helpful in getting it. Um, uh, in, in, in getting a positive reception to it. So I think that was one of the um, uh, insights we found. That's not about your question about guiding research, but it is about um, what to what to take from it. Um, uh, what else was going to say? Um, I uh, then then we also found we were guided when we wrote these narratives of sort of. Um, Oh, don't don't talk about safety. Nobody talks about safety. Airlines don't talk about safety. Safe things don't talk about safety. Um, and so we didn't put safety or waste in any of those narratives. But then we did find in some of the questions that we asked about uh, nuclear that they actually came out quite interesting and discriminating. And so then we thought, well, that's that's interesting. We're not really testing something that we wanted to test. So we wrote an additional narrative. Um, uh, we'd already done the US by this stage, but we put it in for the other countries. We wrote an additional narrative that we put in at the end of the survey that said, let me just tell you something about safety and waste. And it had stats about um, about safety and the, the, the stats that you'll know about, you know, uh, deaths per terawatt hour and so on of nuclear being much lower than other um, energy sources and just how small and contained the nuclear fuel is and how it's solid and, and um, uh, you know, how a life's worth of energy fits in a can of soda and some of those sort of statistics. We put that in a narrative and we said, A, you know, how do you respond to that narrative where people had a question of, um, you know, did you already know that? Um, is that new? Is it surprising? Or, you know, do you still not believe it even now we've told you? And, you know, th there, is, there is a core group of rejectors and and opponents that are quite consistent and we you know, if you look into the full report we kind of analyze um who they are where they come from and how they sit but they're quite they're about 15 percent of the population across our eight countries they're they're not zero but they're a they're a minority in in all countries um and that's the same group that said you can tell me all of that but i still don't believe you but they are and 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 they won't believe you and they don't and they didn't respond to any of our narratives and they had no uplift in the randomized control tile and so on uh, and there is a group that is very resilient like that but for most people um even among the nuclear supporters most people said that oh that's, i didn't know that um and most people were in the i didn't know that but that's kind of interesting bucket so there are some things there and i'm not saying i would sort of lead and campaign around safety but i would not be shy about it in the way that the industry is shy about it i think if you're shy about it and sort of shy about the nuclear name and shy about everything there's a sort of indication of a concern and i think actually the biggest thing that i took from this is is the sort of confidence to be able to talk about some of these things because you're talking you're not talking to that small group you're talking to the to the majority of the population and for the majority of the population they're actually quite open-minded you saw the size of those yellow bars that were in the middle on several of these charts they're quite open-minded they're not anti and they are actually receptive to even some of those sort of gritty messages around safety and waste and things like that thank you that's really helpful Simon, um, thank you so much for for joining us. This was this is really helpful and really interesting work. And we will get the um, link out to the to the full report to the to the group. Um, 
very much appreciate um, you taking some time and um, joining us here today and, and walking us through these different subjects. So thank you again. And, uh, thanks yeah. again. Thanks again for having us. Okay, so um, next up, we've got uh, Will Payne from the Energy Delta Labs just for an update on the activity down in the Southwest. Will, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, the uh, Just a few updates. A lot of things have been happening uh, since, I guess, since this uh, body met last. Um, and with a bunch of folks who are in the room or on Zoom um, today, and great to see. Uh, New director of Department of Energy, uh, Glenn Davis. Um, so uh, the Department of Energy's deputy director, Will Clear, and I joined uh, Bristol Virginia Utilities President Don Bowman, visiting TVA's uh, Watts Bar power plant uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we spent time with the new nuclear VP. Uh, it, it's an impressive operation there, in, impressive people, um, and it was really interesting hearing more about. The TVA and Oak Ridge, you know, partnership. Um, next, uh, the Southwest Virginia Energy Research and Development Authority uh, recently had presentations from Dominion Energy and Appalachian Power regarding uh, balancing the supply of reliable and and clean energy to the you know, utilities uh, customers. Um, the Delta Lab is working closely with Mike Hatfield. I know Mike Hatfield, County Administrator for Wise County, is is on a video today. We've been working, you know, with Wise in particular on a number of utility scale clean energy projects, uh, and also examining needed you know, transmission you know, upgrades to get clean power on the grid long term. Um, recently, the Lenawisco Planning District Commission in Lenawisco it stands for Lee Norton. Uh, Wise and Scott, uh, the uh, PDC released its uh, SMR site feasibility study, and that's feasibility, not identification study. Working with a Northern Virginia-based firm, uh, the study looked at a you know a number of possible locations. Obviously, preliminary, very pre preliminary, uh, and just you know using general site attributes. As a as a one of the steps here in bringing awareness uh, to you know um, this this opportunity uh, that are uh, that's within the footprint for Lynn Wisco, uh, our team the Delta Labs team has been in discussion uh, along with with a lot of people a lot of people on this call and administration on the potential for a, a consortium here with the US EDA's <clears throat> Tech Hubs program and so I think there's a lot more to come on that later. Um, and I, I think the last last one is really excited about next week. Uh, we'll be in Boston at uh, MIT's uh, three day course entitled uh, nuclear energy in a low carbon future uh, with a number of folks around the country. Uh, v next April wave will be joining us. Wise counties. Mike Hatfield will be joining us um, <clears throat> and April can correct me, but I. I hope there's not a test to the end. Uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be pretty intense. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, lots of different topics from the global state of nuclear energy, power plant basics, uh, advanced reactors and advanced fuels, uh, nuclear and hydro the intersection of nuclear and hydrogen, nuclear safety, fusion energy, radiation, uh, health science, and we get to visit in, uh, MIT's test reactor. So uh, that completes my update, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Will. And, um... While there may not be a test at the end of your course, I know um, this authority will expect you in April and uh, Mike to give us a full briefing uh, as new experts in nuclear energy technology at our course. Uh, oh, but thank you. Are there are there any questions for, for Will? Okay, great. Um, so next, I'll turn it over to April for uh, the next couple of days. So, um, for the clinic and they have our EIN number, we're still working with the government's government stuff that has done full page. And then we have a C3 application. So, that's all. So, please, and we need to have organization. It's done. But, but, I'm sorry. Um, and for funding for 
to help you know, we had money in the governor's budget. Um, the budget has not passed, but I don't think the legislature can that um, pass the budget. So, you know, we'll look at what happens next year, but we're going to look at ways that we can start working as. Um, I see you have a workforce very different on the workforce group. Um, where do we have the groups and what is the best? We need to start young and how we only to middle schools, high schools. And luckily, um, with some of these current budget events, I'm doing the work in that model. It's a working group body for it. It's a working consortium and uh, eight of the development team. Um, HB894, working on summit in fall. And having that work is part of that. I'll come and look for that again. Um, and then as Will mentioned, going to high school. Great. Questions for April or any clarifications on the product? I think this one thing um, we are with the consortium working on uh, economic development and education tech hub. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I put on the agenda the annual report. Um, this is more just uh, so if this is on everybody's radar. Uh, this is to remind me, Ryan, it's end of October. End of October. So um, I think what the, the process plan here um, will be is um, Ryan, along with the, the staff at Virginia Energy, will uh, start drafting this year's report. Um, we will circulate it to the authority in advance of our next um, meeting for um, review and comments so that when we come, I think we'll try to um, target a, a kind of late October date for um, so that we can come together, provide any comments, um, hopefully provide any comments back to Ryan before um, that meeting, um, and then we get to do kind of a final review, any comments, and then so on approval, so we can send that to the assembly and the, the governor's office. And with that being said, we will do that meeting in person. We'll need to have a forum, so um, we will to be able to to be able to vote. We'll need an in-person forum, so we will uh, get some days out for poll uh, to, to get some days uh, for that next meeting. Uh, but that'll be the kind of the plan. If you have any. Uh, you know, one of the things I was looking at before this meeting was, you know, our previous annual reports and I have it on my list to talk to Ryan about, um, you know, looking at how do we kind of make sure we're not just updating what we've already had out there. So it's an um, opportunity for kind of refreshing. Uh, so if you have ideas or things um, that you think you should be uh, looking at specifically on that, please, please send those over um, to Ryan um, as we start on I mean, maybe maybe it's more to run spend around the last version, like sooner than later. Yep. But I'm doing really work. Let's send it out because I think that was far at least me. Yep. It's more, that's a great idea. Of what we go over from white sheet. Yeah. Along with, um, we'll send the the link for the uh, presentation with Simon, and then also, uh, yeah, the, the report. Um. So then, uh, just. Logistics, um, we've got the meeting minutes in your packet. These were sent out beforehand. And if there's any, uh, we'll, we'll take a couple minutes now just to, to look over those. If you've got any changes or, or comments, um, we can take them. But just take a couple minutes and 
have anything to speak, to speak up. Um, Chris Brooks here. I have a question, if I may. Uh, what efforts have been made to engage with the local communities and gather their feedback on the potential construction of SMRs in our region? Uh, Chris, that's a that's a good question. Um, we can address that in, in public comments. Can I ask a follow up question? Are any meetings going to be scheduled? Um, in the regions in which these proposed reactors are to be built. That's not something that's in the scope of the authority. We have our meetings uh, quarterly here, usually in Richmond or. or... Okay, um, any any changes or edits to the, to the minutes? I have a motion to approve. So. Second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. Um, so, are there any updates uh, from members? Uh, the only thing for those of you who haven't seen anything except this around uh, Ramatone and CCC um, relaunched uh, the Nuclear Training Academy at the community college. So, this is something that was done when, when we started. Early 2000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a, a program um, where students at CDCC will actually be getting training um, in technician work. Um, they'll also be employed at Tremont Home, and uh, so we actually I think already have the first class that are training to go out to their first outages this fall. Uh, Central Virginia. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just uh, yesterday we announced um, Bucky Martin is the lead partner for the project called Draco. With DARPA, we go in the reactor. Exciting to get calls into other applications. And all that work will take place in Litchburg facilities. Happening in terms of EWXT. Those visiting MIT, we make their fuel. So that fuel is made in Virginia too. So power staff react to MIT. Just a little plug since it came on. <laughs> Anything else? So, one thing along with the um, annual report, I would ask everyone, I know we include this every time, but if you could take a look both at the um, the asset list, both for your own organization's accuracy, and there's anything else, I know Scott and I have discussed this, if you see other things that look, even if they're not for your organization, that you want to flag and just say, hey, we need to go back and check and make sure this is still up to date, um, that would be helpful. I think just since we all are working in the Commonwealth and understand a lot of what's going on here. If there's anything, especially for organizations that aren't represented here, that just needs to be take a second look at it, I think that'll help um, to make sure we're keeping that fully up to date. In terms of general nuclear news, I think we've been we've been providing most of that to the group. There's a ton going on all the time, including Congress is considering Defense Authorization Act right now, which has a lot of uh, stuff around fuel security and, and um, defense programs for, for so um, if you have specific questions in the room, we can always answer them, but um, I'll say we'll continue to send that send that information out. Uh, with that, if there are other there are other questions or comments from authority before we open it up.
Okay, so um, for those of you who are joining our meeting for the maybe the first time, we just go over the, the process here. So this is again, this is our time for, for public comment. Um, I would ask if you have or would like to make public comments, um, please raise your hand so we can call on everybody individually. Uh, and we don't have anybody in the room, uh, but Eric, are you still on the phone? On the WebEx? Okay. Yes. Uh, she's she's Eric, Erica, do you wanna do you have um, comments? We'll let you go first. You Erica, you may be on mute if you're trying to talk. We can, we can come back. Is there anyone else uh, that wants to raise their hand on the on the WebEx that has comments? Tasha, please go ahead. Two minutes. Hi, thank you. It's Tasha. Uh, Tasha Devon from Wise County. Um, I had a question. I chair the Virginia Council of Environmental Justice, and I do know that per the Clean Economy Act, that uh, we are identified as a key stakeholder. Um, so I was wondering, um, I don't remember any engagement on uh, Virginia Organizing's behalf to come present this information to us. So I was wondering if there was anything in the future of anybody in this group who was going to come to us to do that. Which information are you asking about specifically? Uh, so per the Clean Energy Economy Act, we are a key stakeholder. Uh, key stakeholder identified as a group that has to be consulted when it comes to any energy development, uh, specifically in Southwest Virginia. And we have not heard of these plans or anything really until recently. So I was just wondering if there was any um, plans to uh, communicate with our group or to communicate with the communities of Southwest Virginia. I think one question would be on the, the plan specifically that you're talking about, but I'm sure we can we can connect you with the right people to, to look at that. So, if you want to follow up with, with Brian, who's um, here, that's something we can look at. Okay, will do. Thank you. Erica, we're working on making sure you can, we can hear you. Just one second. Ivor. Yeah. It says she's on mute and able to talk. I just, I don't know. Erica, do you want to try again? It says on our screen that you're not on mute. So we should be able to hear you. All right, we'll go to um, Christopher Brooks. Hi, yes. Um, again, hi, um, I'm from Southwestern Virginia. My question is how, how is the uh, construction of SMRs in our communities going to increase the quality of life in this region. Um, how many people are going to be employed? What are those jobs going to pay? Um, how's that going to break down demographically? Also, how is this going to affect um, taxes in our region? How's this going to affect the cost of living in our region? And um, what are the risks in uh, constructing these sites so close to residential and school areas that may not have been addressed by the studies cited by the industry so far. And in asking that question, I would like to refer to the citation in chat to the Stanford University and University of British Columbia studies that actually concluded that small nuclear reactors will complicate the problem of nuclear waste disposal and will, provide, um, will present challenges um, in mitigating the risk to the communities. 
Uh, sure, those are those are good questions. I think as a specific project or technologies identified, a lot of that um, information is something that would be um, generated and available. But right now, without a, a specific project, I'm not sure that those give a full answer on those. And, and I, that's not really in the scope of this. But we're in right? more of an advisory role for the uh, for the Commonwealth government, but not in the specific um, project. Fascinating. We appreciate the engagement and, and happy to continue to either connect you with the right people or, or have further discussion. Hello. Hey, Erica. There you are. We can hear you. Wow. Finally. I don't know what happened with that, but yeah, I was completely muted. So you can hear me now. We can hear you now. You're all set. Okay. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, I guess this new way of letting everybody in the public know that there's a meeting is now just going to be on this uh, town square. Am I right? Because I didn't see it. I couldn't find it anywhere else. Town yeah, hall is where this is publicly posted, correct? So is that the only place it's going to be posted? I will accept responsibility if I did not send you an email that is my fault. Okay, well, yeah, I think the public can't really like be involved if they don't really know where to find the information. Um, but besides that, I mean, obviously, I had, I, I'm sure others were like me. We could not hear April pretty much at all. So, and that's the the business side of of uh, the Virginia Nuclear Energy. Uh, think tank, and so um, y'all need to get a little bit better with audio. I mean, I don't usually do audio. I'm usually there, uh, but I've been having car trouble. So uh, that's neither here or there. So if y'all could please get better so that when we do participate on the phone that we can actually hear what's being said. Uh, luckily, uh, because Simon called in from London, he, he I could hear him very well. Um, I think the big gist of in today's world of influencers, um, it's always a matter of how we present the information to the public on the kind of answers we want to get from them. And I thought it was very telling that we don't want to use the quote unquote scary word, which is reactor, or show the image of cooling towers, that it's not good. And actually, small modular reactors was not either something that really wanted to be mentioned. So, of course, it's kind of like trickery because telling people, you know, nuclear energy technologies and renewables, blah, 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 you know, I mean, it's gonna, you're going to get a different reaction than if you were actually to say, hey, our plan actually is to set up these small modular reactors at all defunct coal burning plants and use their grid that's already there. And we're going to charge y'all exorbitant prices for the energy produced, and we're going to now put everybody on the dole for the risks that are going to be implied. And yes, the Ukraine reactor, there are a lot of us that are paying attention, and we hope the world doesn't have to pay attention because we end up with another catastrophic disaster there. So what can go wrong could go wrong, and at some point will go wrong. So small modular reactors, are not the answer to uh, climate change because of the cost, because of everything else involved. And plus, these are not really out there yet. A lot of them still just on paper. I think the other biggest problem we have is, you want to talk about energy dependence, or independence, should I say. Um, I guess we're going to have to ramp up all the uranium mining again. I already saw that they're ramping up, I guess, for processing in Wyoming. Um, is this really clean energy when we're going to ramp up all these productions of uranium mining and uh, processing and then end up with more plutonium and other byproducts and more nuclear waste? I mean, it's very disturbing because the way it's being presented to the public, it's not honest. It's not real. And in the words of uh, scientists and um um, someone that I respect a lot in, uh, in Canada, um, Gordon Edwards, 
and I'll paraphrase because this is also true, that, you know, besides this um, technology not being able to compete, that uh, there is a fundamental problem with nuclear. It doesn't matter the size, the design, the coolant, or the type of fuel. All is based on splitting atoms, and they don't disappear, yet get broken down into hundreds of pieces that are now millions of times more radioactive than the fuel they started with. The fact is, every nuclear reactor, no matter the size, is not just a machine to generate electricity or heat, but is also a warehouse of radioactive poison. And in today's world, cyber problems, there was one at one of the major labs not a couple of months ago, anything can happen. Last thing we need is to dot around our country or the world these little warehouses of poison. It's just not smart. And to make matters worse, we don't have the ability to look at making our own fuel because of our Russian ties to fuel are, being, are cut off, and the same thing with the rest of the world. So we're going to have new uranium mining and whatnot or other fuels. It, this is not clean energy, and it's very expensive. So public-private partnerships, uh, you know, the public needs to be informed correctly with the whole full truth, not like half-truths or partial emissions or whatever y'all are doing. The reality is we already have lots of nuclear waste sitting around at every nuclear power plant already, and it's sitting in the pools that are overfilled, and they're dragging their feet. The industry drags its feet. The utilities on unloading these into the HOS, where supposedly it's a little bit safer. These are not going to be able to just pop them down into a hole in the ground and just forget about it. This is a lot more complicated. So we don't have the solutions for what we have already. It makes absolutely positively no sense to make more of it. And that's not to even consider that the nuclear canisters we have right now, we don't even know if, uh, how long they'll last. So all this gibberish talking about new nuclear, small nuclear, which is not small either, by the way. You wanna make people think in their minds it's something small, but it's not. So, you know, this industry, this consortium, this authority should really be looking at securing the waste that we have now and the canisters, not making more of it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Not seeing any. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for joining us. Um, keep an eye out for uh, the poll for the October meeting and some materials that the last year's annual report and the presentation from today. But uh, appreciate it for your time. Have a good one. Thank you. See you next time. Hey, Bob.